Smart Construction is pleased to present this virtual seminar, Collaborative Approach and Integrated Design Towards Net Zero Carbon. My name is Dr. Wendu Oguda, and I'm the Center Manager for the Center. Please note, we are recording this webinar and all lines are muted. If you need help at any time, please send us a message via the Q&A chat box below. Today's event will last up to 60 minutes. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the event. Simply type them into the Q&A chat box in the lower center of the screen, and then be sure to click the send button. So I want to say a few things about the center of excellence in smart construction. The center is committed to advancing industry-led innovations in the built environment that will revolutionize the way we develop, manage, and operate smarter cities. Our partners are like-minded organizations and government entities who want to lead the transformation of the built environment and development of next generation professionals for the benefit of the economy. The center is a global hub for disruptive thinking, a platform for collaborative research and a model for solutions development and stakeholder engagement. The center's industry-led research and development has a focus on enabling technologies around three main research themes, performance and productivity, sustainability, and well-being. The collaboration is intended to provide leadership in the future direction of the industry that will inform policy decision makers. We'd like to acknowledge um, our four partners, Alec, Jacobs, ASGC, and Mark McDonald, who have been integral to the development of the center and their engagement with industry. And we're pleased to say that we've got representatives from our partner organizations on the panel at this webinar. It's now my pleasure to introduce our esteemed industry and academic experts. Lisa Gerbach Terry is a sustainability consultant at Mark McDonald, based in the Abu Dhabi office. She's leading the carbon management agenda in the UAE, which provides project management of the first implementation of PAS 2080, the first carbon management standard for infrastructure in the Middle East. And this was co-authored by Mark McDonald. Lisa's experience also includes inputs on green building and healthy building assessment frameworks. Professor Tyke O'Donovan is the head of School of Science and Engineering at Teotihuacan University, Dubai. He has over 15 years research experience in thermal science, which now has a focus on solar energy conversion systems and storage. His, re his research group is mainly funded by the UK government research institutions and relates to the development of low cost solar collector technology. He has established collaborative links with industry and employs a techno-economic approach to support renewable energy companies. Dr. Yanni Spanos is Regional Manager of Sustainability and Environmental Services at Kiel International Consultants. He's a consultant, professional engineer, and sustainability expert with 20 years of experience. As Kiel Regional Manager, he provides professional consultancy and strategy related services to government institutions, investment funds, developers, architects, and contractors. His experience includes the development of sustainable real estate assets, renewable energy, and urban development programs in MENA, UK, Europe, and Africa. He's currently based in the Gulf region and works closely with world government organizers and developers of future global destinations. I'm pleased to say that also Yanni is a Herat Watt University alumni. Philippa Grant is AESG's Global Director of Sustainability. Philippa has worked on some of the most complex and prestigious sustainability projects in ASGC's portfolio, including the development and implementation of Dubai's demand sign management programs and multiple pavilions at Dubai Expo 2020. Philippa leads all of 
AESD's energy and sustainability related strategic advisory projects. In 2018, Philippa was recognized for her performance by AESG Sustainable Business Leadership Awards and was awarded Sustainability Manager of the Year. In 2019, Philippa was awarded the Highly Commended Engineer of the Year at the Construction Week Awards 2019. Harry Seeley is Environmental and Sustainability Manager at Jacobs. He has over 20 years experience in environmental management and sustainability. He has been instrumental in successfully pioneering the use of SQL on major civil engineering infrastructure projects, leading to the first ever SQL certified projects in the Middle East, which has also won the SQL Exceptional Achievement Award for the water and environment category. I will now hand over to Lisa, our moderator for this, year, for this evening's webinar. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nrandu. Um, yeah, so my name is Lisa. I'm just going to give a quick introduction to um, the presentation. So the net zero carbon billings commitment set by the World Green Billing Council calls whole regions and cities and companies to reach net zero carbon and operation for all assets under their control by 2030 and to promote all buildings to be net zero in operation by 2050. And to reach ambitious targets like that, um, but also to meet obligations like the Paris Agreement and to support the United, Sustainable, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, it is widely recognized that a collaboration-based approach is becoming more and more essential. In the construction industry and in general, carbon can be seen as a proxy for efficiency the way we do things and the way we design things. So if we design in an effective and sustainable way, then we are actually one step closer to achieve these ambitious, ambitious targets. Um, but what could that look in detail? Um, and that's what Professor Tahek um, will talk about. And we will start this evening's webinar with a presentation which, look ex which will look exactly in that um, th thematic um, is how we can move towards a net zero carbon future in construction. So it's over to you, Taik. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen. I think you should be able to see my slides now. Thumbs up. Good. Um, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, seminar today. A um, bit of an introduction to me already. I, I've, I've heard uh, it there, and thank you for that, Wendy. Um, probably you should uh, fess up, though, at the very beginning. The one detail you left out is that I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer, so to a certain extent, I'm an imposter here. Uh, <laughs> but what I want to talk about is the work that I've done with my research group as part of a larger kind of decarbonization agenda that the university, um, Harry Watt University has across its global campuses. So back, oh, well, quite a few years ago, um, we uh, successfully won some research funding uh, sponsored by the uh, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council uh, through something called an impact acceleration account uh, call, uh, looking at decarbonization. And uh, one of the ideas that, that we came up with was to run a series of workshops that would bring all the relevant stakeholders together um, from industry uh, to see if we could somehow capture the challenges as well as some of the practices that, that were um, affecting that particular uh, industry um, and, and see is it in line um, to meet its sustainable uh, goals or these uh, quite challenging goals that have been set down in, in many international accords and see where the where intervention perhaps is 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 needed. And like what has said, what you've heard today already, and what you'll probably hear more of is is the kind of synergistic role that can be played between uh, academia and industry in this regard. So this is a bit of a glimpse into what we did, and uh, and uh, what we uh, suppose found in a very short uh, presentation. So the title what I have here is the same as that of the uh, the workshops that we ran back in in January. Uh, I think it was late January or early February, uh, certainly uh, pre-COVID. <laughs> uh, over a two-day uh, period, we ran a workshop. We, in we invited representatives from across 
um, various sectors of the construction industry in the UAE uh, under the title Transitioning the UAE Construction Industry to a Net Zero Carbon Future. And uh, before I, I progress to so some of the highlights and, as well as some of the processes uh, that we went through in this workshop, I do need to shout out to, to my research team, mostly based in, in the UK, um, one of my PhD students, Lois Hurst, a recent graduate PhD student of mine, now Dr. Stefano Landini, uh, Louis Marie, and uh, Kader Zengen, uh, all based actually in our UK campus, uh, who came in for, for the week um, with a, to a certain extent, not the same level of civil or construction industry background, but we, we, we tried to see that as a merit. We tried to come into this to a certain extent cold. We have some experience certainly in sustainability. Uh, we uh, mostly are looking at, at systems, but we like the kind of technology agnostic approach to design. And uh, we're, as you uh, heard from my bio, things like techno-economics, full life cycle analysis, embodied energy operating there. These are all um, words that we speak uh, and, and use and employ in our design um, function. And it was really interesting to kind of come in without bias uh, to, to listen to uh, the practitioners on the ground. The, the, these are practitioners of, of course, also leaders um, in the UAE. And uh, I'll give you a full list of the contributors at the end of this. So this is what we did. Um, it, you know, coming to this even cold, it was alarming to see some of these statistics. We, of course, knew that there were challenges uh, here, and we knew that uh, the construction industry um, is a significant contributor to some of uh, the, let's say, less favorable emissions in, in our environment here. And you can see that it is reportedly, and I always have an asterisk here because it's very hard to get down to an absolute truth. And what you'll probably find in some of what I report here is it's how you draw circles around certain things, around certain activities that influences very much the outcome here. So depending on the reference you go with, um, we, we certainly found a somewhat repeated reference to uh, the construction sector, however you define that, as 28 and 11 percent of energy related carbon dioxide emissions, uh, respectively. So, but whichever way you cut it, and even if we argued figures at a later stage, it's significant. And, it's, and, and the main um, uh, conclusion you can draw from this is it's going to be pretty much impossible. To, to reach any of the very ambitious targets that are set down in UAE or anywhere in the world for that matter, uh, without um, the building and construction sector taking a significant um, reduction in, in its uh, contributions there. So what we did, we, we had over two days, a couple of business breakfasts where we, um, we, we listened. We were perhaps the, orchestra, uh, the, the conductor of the orchestra, uh, asking what we thought were the right questions, listening to what the practice was on the ground, and trying to reflect that back um, critically. We brought in the literature, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the science perhaps uh, that, that came to underpin it, and then to see where they were in line uh, with, with current practice, or, or sometimes where they were in conflict, and, and sometimes where, um, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a second, how policy might have had good intent, but very different outcomes. Those were the kind of the stark uh, findings of this. So uh, if I do no more than this slide than to uh, recommend some reading here, this is a, a white paper that we have that we'd be very happy to circulate and uh, we'd always uh, welcome your feedback uh, to that. Um, okay, so uh, the main thing here is that we obviously we're looking at life cycle and circular economy approaches that can uh, identify the true potential of the sector to decarbonize. And that really comes to how we account uh, for, for carbon and, uh, and you know, to what extent we can, we can therefore have an influence uh, on it. So what the uh, paper reports on is uh, policy and strategy. I'll, I'll just go to the, the higher headlines here. Uh, current practices, and this uh, goes from, uh, and I will have a slide on this too, on, on the full um, cradle to grave approach from resources, materials and transport right through to uh, the actual process of, of construction to uh, the, the built environment and however long it lasts to its uh, ultimate demise and decommissioning. Um, we looked a little bit at the innovation and technology and how that is changing the sector. Um, what are the challenges that, that are out there? And these are many and, and as you can see varied. 
And uh, we tried to conclude with some recommendations. And we actually have, uh, I think it's uh, one or two pages of, of, of bullet pointed recommendations. What I'll do in this um, presentation is just highlight some of the, the larger thematic uh, recommendations that, uh, well, we objectively at least uh, were able to make uh, from the whole experience. I do want to start with a little bit of theory, though. And this is what, uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, graphs. And it comes from work that we're doing at the moment um, on the, um, the retrofit design. So the idea being, if, you, if you're retrofitting whatever um, building, you're, you're generally moving along the x-axis here. You're probably going from a conventional building somehow along towards low energy buildings, passive houses, even self-sufficiency on the x-axis. So I, I should point out, I should not like this graph um, <laughs> because there's no units on it. And there's certainly no value uh, on it, but uh, but it is a nice schematic, and, and I'm sure some of you are already familiar with it. And as you can see, then on the y-axis, we have our energy requirements. So what you'll see is that obviously operational energy will go from uh, very high up, where we have conventional conventional buildings, uh, down to zero, where we have self-sufficient buildings. And then we have the kind of the embodied energy uh, element uh, to it. And generally, what you'll find is that conventional buildings will have um, a certain amount of, I got that the wrong way around, didn't I? Uh, it is my embodied energy that should go from top to bottom. Um, but you'll see that the uh, operational energy decreases and then um, increases uh, again. I am definitely getting my, my axes mixed up. I guess the point here is that there ends up being a sweet spot where you can put in more and more embodied energy into your construction with the view to getting to self-sufficiency. However, that is not necessarily having the positive influence that you would like it to be, uh, because uh, of course you're investing too much in your body's energy and not getting the return in terms of operation. So this was good, and it was a good starting point for us, but that was no more than that, because as I said, it is an annoying graph for an engineer because it doesn't have any numbers on it. And it, all it is is a story. It, it tells a little bit of a story and uh, we get the, the, the idea, the concept is no more than that. However, it is uh, published, as you can see here, by Capello uh, back in 2017. So as any good engineer, we decided to try to put some numbers on it. And through an extensive uh, review of the literature, uh, we, we would review as much as possible and take whatever numbers they had to get a better sense of scale. We've, we've changed the axis slightly on the X and Y axis here to be per annum again. And of course, that kind of normalization does have an effect on the, uh, on the I suppose, the relevance of the axis as much as anything else, because it does uh, depend on how long. Uh, you expect your, your, your building to, to survive and whether there are interventions throughout its lifetime. But it, it, it gave us an idea, I suppose, more of the, the slope and how these uh, can interact. So we're looking here, um, I don't have a stylus here, I don't know if you can see my, uh, my uh, cursor here, but from new build to retrofit, you can see how the potential gains uh, go together and through these slopes. And sometimes it's difficult even just to see the slope, but you can, uh, you can measure them uh, as you go here as the coefficient of x uh, uh, here. And, I, and, really, uh, and then obviously by normalization through a here, it would uh, change this level quite uh, significantly. But it does give a, perhaps a less pretty picture than uh, or the ultimate goal of finding the optimum finding the optimum is going to it was definitely going to be a challenge if you took just alone the scatter that was in that then you have to then appreciate the the um, the scale of the challenge that, that was uh, ahead of us so to go one um, further we um, well we started defining we started looking at it ourselves we, we asked ourselves the question what is embodied energy um, and, and where is it measured from? And it is a very difficult thing to draw a circle around. However, we've done many circles or, or areas in, in this one here. If you go from the product, which would include, include the uh, raw materials, transport, manufacture, uh, through the construction process, again, there's transportation there, construction of the building itself. Uh, if you're looking at the use, maintenance, refurbish, re retrofit, these kind of uh, uh, in, uh, interventions that you might have, as well as whether you're having heating or cooling, uh, lighting, appliances, auxiliary systems, uh, uh, as well as the end of life. That could be argued is a full cradle to grave, where we have interactions with the embodied uh, carbon and obviously the operating carbon. And I do apologize at the moment for using embodied carbon and embodied energy as if they're one and the same. 
but um, obviously they are somewhat uh, related. Uh, so this brings in standards and definitions because if you can't measure it, how do you change it? And this is what really came through in the, in the workshop. Different approaches and, and with different standards. Um, we had a lot of people saying, yes, yes, we do full life cycle analysis on things according to standards, and, and that may be. But around where do you draw your um, circles? Where do you start? Where do you stop? And uh, are we comparing like for like? So that brought us to more questions. And a relatively, no, it was quite extensive, but these uh, these highlighted the um, the the differences, I suppose, that you uh, might uh, take um, in in how people account for embodied energy or embodied uh, carbon or even um, the operational side of things. So if we have along here, along the top here, you can see whether or not a particular researcher or assessor, in this case, uh, uh, accounted for raw material extraction, the manufacturing process, the construction, the transport, the maintenance, the end of life, uh, the feedstock, uh, energy, uh, direct and indirect energy, and uh, non-renewable energy. And you can see with the different scatter um, about Dixit down here in 2019, trying to include everything uh, in comparison to Kazitsa here in 2013, only includes a few. Um, it probably uh, pointed certainly to the challenges that the sector faces in even just accounting uh, for its uh, for its impact uh, as well, and which makes it obviously very difficult then to make an intervention or to have a policy that is going to um, that is going to have a tangible positive impact. Um, and uh, as you can see here, the, you know, in, in some cases, the exact terminology used were different. For example, construction versus assembly, maintenance versus uh, 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 what's that like? uh, rehabilitation, manufacture versus production. Uh, so the certain assumptions need to be made. And it does seem as an industry that it is difficult to get to a, a common source. And then um, this is one also by Dixit, which, which gives us this kind of three-dimensional model for describing a system boundary. So if we look at what we have is our X, Y, and Z here, our X axis are building life cycle phases. So as we're going through the, uh, the phase of the whole built environment, uh, Y is the extent of the life cycle inventory in both upstream and downstream directions for each life cycle phase. And then um, Z is our physical scale of the analysis from component level to building envelope, building site, or even extended uh, to neighborhood or city level. Th these are the challenges that seem to be facing the, the research certainly in, in this area at the moment is just coming to this kind of common consensus of what matters, who's responsible for it, and, and ultimately how can it therefore, how can we have an approach that will um, lead to a more sustainable uh, decarbonized industry. So recommendations on that, and you can imagine all we were doing at this stage was um, reflecting or trying to get to um, the challenges that the industry were facing. And we really had to take 10 steps back and, and understand that the accounting was difficult enough. And then to see, well, what, what positive impacts have people been trying to take uh, at the moment, and how are they affecting uh, the industry? So um, in, in three categories here, policy regulations and incentives, we saw that low carbon could be achieved by deployment of low energy buildings with low uh, full life cycle carbon. So this was about, I mean, it was quite obvious one, right? It's that if you are going to do it, that you're going to have to take a sort of full life cycle approach. The key thing here was not just to the integration and use of renewable energy. Which some might, in you know, draw an analogy with um, with uh, with um, carbon trading um, that that nations might be involved in. It doesn't matter for as long as I'm net zero carbon. I'll just buy my credits from somewhere else, or I'll slap a solar panel on it, and I will tick that box. And I, will, I, I and if, and there's a certain amount of tick boxing going on in that regard. Regulations should stipulate a target energy usage per uh, usable floor area to ensure the elemental targets work in coordination to achieve the, the best performance. That's a quite technical one that kind of, um, there was a certain amount of variance into even the floor area that, that uh, would be accounted for in any particular building. Materials and life cycle analysis uh, should be implemented uh, at the design stage to minimize life cycle carbon impacts. I, a tendency, 
Um, certainly, that, uh, we have even in uh, systems design is to build it first and to ask questions later, as in, to, in retrospect, to uh, figure it out. While a lot of interventions and a lot of design now is starting with a life cycle analysis to start with to, to understand whether a, um, a particular design is going to have good um, operational and, and embodied energy, it, it didn't extend to the, to the full industry. So one of the recommendations was certainly to, um, to have that one to the fore and, and have it inputting into the, um, the design and decision uh, making. Um, so, and then there's something about uh, the, the tools here that would be used in terms of energy, economic, and environmental factors. Um, down then to design, development, and construction. Well, uh, energy focused specialists could work alongside designers. And this is about the integrated approach. In fact, if I was to take one take home from the, from the workshop, it was how everybody who with, uh, with very different backgrounds would, um, would all emphasize that communication was not the best or that they all had different pressures on them um, to be able to achieve often very different things under the same banner, if that makes sense. So um, what took priority? Um, was it ultimately the customer who pays the bills or, or, or and, and where were corners cut uh, so that you would uh, eventually reach uh, the target? These were the challenges that seemed to be uh, faced by most uh, practitioners in the industry, whether they were in the design process or not. And it was a case of bringing together those who were the architects, together with the developers, together with the practitioners on the ground. And uh, improved continuity of decarbonization approaches from the design stage. Well, again, it sounds like an obvious one. And what we found is that it tends to be very feature specific. Uh, that the, you know, what, maybe you're looking, I'll take a, uh, an easy example here about reducing solar gain in buildings. You might say from a design phase that, well, that goes in, but, but how did that necessarily um, happen in terms of how uh, things were put together, how the construction phase uh, went together? Those were the challenges uh, that people faced. Uh, so, and that's how the, the sentence ends there, right through the construction, commissioning, handover and operation to ensure that no, there was no performance gaps. And it was in the gaps where the, where the uh, things fell a bit short. So that's a very, very brief overview. And I, I'm also conscious I'm probably terribly repetitive over time. Uh, but I do want to at least shout out to all these contributors who were uh, really engaging really rose to the challenge over a two-day period and, and and i hope i know it was a very positive experience from the academic perspective uh, we certainly enjoyed everything from the the, the work to the social interaction uh, at the end and it's um it's, yes thanks to all of these who who engaged uh, the whole way through the process so thank you very much for listening and i'm happy to contribute to questions in the panel discussion later Awesome. Thank you so much, Tyke, for, for this presentation. Um, we're going to move now into our panelist discussion. I want to encourage everyone on the call, if you have any questions, to drop them into the chat box and I will pick them uh, as we go along. Um, so, Tyek, um, just um, to kind of um, yeah, a question on the importance of collaboration, which you which you mentioned. We had uh, uh, the workshops earlier in the year, and on the back of it, you developed this um, white paper, which is yeah. which is amazing. Um, so, just in terms of like future um, the the future opportunities for collaboration, where do you see that between um, industry and academia? So there are lots. I mean, <clears throat> what you'll probably have uh, seen there is that we took a very academic approach uh, to this, but we had input from industry. And if, I mean, you'll probably see there's a chasm between us uh, at, at the beginning, um, but we need each other is, is the important part. And we need to bridge that chasm because there's a tremendous amount of literature uh, out there. Um, that does make sense. You know, it, it is, it is uh, peer reviewed and it, and it makes sense and it's, it, it's good. However, and, and you'll see this again in policy as well, which often comes from literature. It's the good intent. However, practice on the ground. If you cannot influence what I normally refer to as human factors in my line of, of, of business, if you don't influence that, it can be for nothing. It, it, you might, there's many ways where we try to get to our, um, uh, I don't know, let's say our tick box exercise to get to uh, to get to those values that we want to get to 
Um, however, they're not always with the same intent of what the, um, the uh, regulations state. So one of the things that um, I think where I think universities can work with industry on is, is partly in policy. It's, um, it's developing the correct guidelines that will actually have a tangible impact that, that can be a little bit more harmonious. And they might also help with um, establishing collaborations or the dynamics that might happen within the, what is a tremendously complicated industry uh, with so many different um, uh, stakeholders. So, the, you know, as a technologist myself, I, I'm really doing myself out of a job here uh, to start with because I'm not going for the you know decarbonized brick, which Terry Watt has, by the way, uh, or anything like that. I'm actually going for the, you know, it, if I was to take what we did here, it was the communication, it was the organization, it was the logistics, it was, that's where um, I, I think the, the cogs need a little bit greasing. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Um, Taik um, also touched on the, um, the importance of the supply chain and um, the life cycle analysis in his presentation. Um, so I just wanna, ask um, Harry, um, what role do you think uh, incentives for good carbon management throughout the project life, life cycles would play um, with supply chain partners, um, contractors and consultants? Thanks for that. And uh, Taig, thanks for the excellent presentation. That was, that was really interesting. Um, I think in terms of supply chain, one of the things that um, we became very aware of this year was how vulnerable all economies are, regardless of where they are in, on the planet. If, if things, uh, for some reason, get impacted by something like COVID, um, hopefully we're, we're coming to the end of that tunnel. And, but you know, who knows, that there, there might be another pandemic, pandemic sometime in the future. So the point being, um, the, the key aspect of this in terms of decarbonization is to see how, as early as possible in the design, we can start looking at dematerializing the designs of structures. So minimize the amount of materials needed, minimize the amount of concrete, minimize the, you know, the, the volume of material needed. Therefore, by default, in, in some respects, you're, you're de-risking your supply chain. If you need less materials for your structures, therefore you're less, less exposed to uh, um, problems in the supply chain and therefore your buildings are more, or your, your, your structures are more resilient in, in the face of things like a global pandemic. Uh, that's the first thing to, to mention. The other thing in terms of supply chain is um, I would, in, in fora like this, I think it's really important that we don't forget the importance of sustainable procurement strategies. Um, and I think particularly in the Middle East, um, knowing people that are in procurement myself, quite often, unfortunately, procurement um, uh, role is looked almost as a secretarial administrative kind of a uh, not quite you know, well basically an, an administrative role rather than a strategically important role um, and therefore you get um, you the, you're missing out the skill set where uh, a proper procurement strategy or proper sustainable procurement professionals can inform what is best in terms of materials uh, availability in either the region or um, in terms of from sustainable sources, uh, make that distinction between something that's um, from a sustainable source, but then, you know, the carbon footprint associated with flying it in the planet, it's uh, the whole thing nonsensical. Um, so there needs to be very carefully thought out sustainable procurement strategies that is then enshrined in the contracts, which is my next very important point on this decarbonization of the construction industry is not going to happen by magic. Um, it is going to happen, though, by making sure that uh, contracts that are let from even from master planning stage through to, to design and construction are all based around fundamental principles of, of sustainability and decarbonization. Do not expect the construction contractor to suddenly do the right thing and uh, make sure that their buildings are all green and decarbonized in, in terms of the uh, embodied carbon. If that hasn't been built into the um, the contractual requirements, so that that's another huge piece is in terms of making sure the supply chain uh, decarbonization of the supply chain is embroiled in the or is, is embedded in the contracts. I'll I'll pause there because it's a subject you can probably talk for a long time. But yeah, that that was a really good answer, though. Yeah, um, 
Thank you so much. Um, so building on that, Harry, um, just, just to touch on, 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 on your answer, do you think there's appetite, because we now kind of talked about around um, the construction, um, but do you think there's appetite actually for um, operators um, in terms of an incentive strategy to, um, to contribute to that agenda? I would like to think so, but I think the, um, the accounting model needs to change very rapidly. Uh, we spent 30 or 40 years deciding whether or not climate change is real. Um, we realized that that was a big mistake. We should have been listening to the, uh, the somewhat um, derided so-called tree hugger and hippie brigade that were actually telling the truth all along. Um, if we'd listened to them 30 or 40 years ago, the, the planet would not be in the position we are today. We do not have another 30 or 40 years to decide about how we're going to do this. There has to be very deep fundamental and systemic change very, very quickly now. Um, and thankfully, the Middle East is one of those regions where such changes can be implemented relatively quickly in comparison to, say, in the UK or Europe or the US, where everybody has to gather around Congress and things have got to get passed and God knows what else happens. Um, if the, the business case is made and uh, the, there's a joint willingness through the, the powers that have the, uh, the authority to, to make these changes in, in, in our region, the Middle East region, then I think those changes can be made quite quickly. Um, so yes, the time is now, um, the technology is available, the contracting strategies will, will make sure that that can happen in a relatively short time frame. Um, but also in terms of the, the accounting side, we need to move away from this uh, return on investment on CapEx there, there is yeah. far too much inhibition in achieving these uh, these goals of um, achieving you know towards net zero. Is the accountants demand to see the profit and loss columns at the end of the next quarter? You're not going to see the return on investment in the next quarter. You're not going to see it in the next year probably. What you are going to see it is in the operational lifespan of these projects, um, and that needs to be a fundamental um, step change in the way. Um, those that are responsible for allocating budgets and uh, and calculating feasibility really need to change how we think and how the metrics stack up. Yeah. Um, something we didn't touch on so far is data management. And um, Philip, I would like to hear your opinion on what data you think could enable decarbonization of the construction sector and how could we better collect it and share, kind of breaking out of the silos it seems we're kind of working at, at the moment. Yeah, data is an interesting uh, subject. Um, I think uh, it definitely uh, it's definitely a really important um, tool uh, to kind of um, you know create business case arguments and and to drive the the sustainability agenda. Um, but kind of uh, in in hand with that, we would need to be really careful not to kind of overly rely on you know data or, or let data kind of um, drive decision making too much. Um, there also needs to be kind of uh, a strategic, um, you know, uh, direction and, and alignment there. Um, but no, data is really important. It's really important for us to understand the impact that decisions that we're making early on in the uh, project lifecycle have um, throughout its its uh, its full life um, lifespan. As Harry was saying, you know, we can make decisions very early on in the design stage that are going to have a big impact. Um, during the operational stage um, and collecting data during that operational stage on existing projects really helps to kind of feed back into that into that decision making process. So um, it is really important for us to collect uh, data where possible um, and to then analyze that data and understand what it means and you know what what that data is, is demonstrating um, and what it's telling us. You know, it's telling us that the, the, this strategy is working, this one isn't. Um, and helping that to, to guide us, but then, you know, coupling that with a bit of um, uh, common sense um, and a little bit of, you know, new thinking and, and innovative thinking. We don't want to be, you know, limited to the, the strategies of, you know, the last 10 years, just because that's what we have data for. Um, we also need to be willing to, to take a chance on, on new approaches um, because, yeah, I guess linking back to, to what Harry was saying, we don't really have time um, to, to keep, you know, um, uh, going down the same path and, and just making the same mistakes that we've made in the past. We need to really, you know, try these new approaches, try these, uh, this innovative um, uh, thinking. And I think tying back to kind of the, the connection uh, with academia, 
um, there's really, you know, a, a chance to connect with, um, you know, all of these uh, research bodies and, and um, teams that are looking at all of this stuff and looking at it theoretically and saying, hey, guys, there's an opportunity here to do something new and making sure then that the industry is listening to that um, and spotting opportunities to apply it in, in real life situations. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's very important to collect data um, and to, to use that to kind of uh, back our arguments, I guess, when we're trying to persuade clients and um, more uh, data-driven people that we want to try something, um, but also not letting it uh, stifle innovation and, and creative thinking. So, um, yeah, it's a careful balance, I guess. Yeah. In your experience, um, do you think there's like the, the appetite in the industry for that innovative approach, the way we use data, or is it is it pretty, um, yeah, just stick to the conventional methods what what do you think oh no i think there is a there's a big appetite for innovation at the moment um you know i like to have an optimistic <laughs> viewpoint on the industry yeah. i don't like to be too kind of uh, pessimistic about things there are obviously the um uh, the more commercially driven minds and you're always going to to have those as part of the the wider stakeholder team and and it's important to have people like that i mean you know not to um downplay anyone uh, who's part of a project like it's very important obviously that there's a financial business model yeah, behind, um, behind these projects um, but no I think there's a big appetite for innovation um, it's really great we've gone we have seen a bit of a shift in the last kind of five years going from um, uh, us trying to drive the clients to for new thinking and, and clients now kind of pushing back against us a bit and saying you know have you thought about something new on this which is great um so we're really enjoying kind of that um uh, that interaction and, and having clients that are a little bit more aspirational in, in their goals so yeah i think it's a i think it's it's a really good time in the industry and in the market at the moment to to push these things that's really amazing to hear i'm all for a positive approach um and a positive mindset on that um thank you so much for that um, Janis, um, we talked um, earlier around um, yeah, project life cycle. We all know that cost is um, reported throughout the design stage. Do you believe that the adoption of a mandatory carbon reporting would be beneficial? What, what are your thoughts on that? Interesting uh, to hear. It's a it's very interesting point. And, and um, I, might know, I know that in other countries are already doing it as part of not uh, country regulations, but uh, specific regional regulations. Now, it is part of the overall carbon emissions of the project that was highlighted by that earlier. And it was, the graph was very useful for people to understand that as the energy is reduced and we have to drive the energy down to achieve the zero carbon. Suddenly, we're going to find that most of the energy associated with the project will be linked with the construction and the embodied, and the embodied energy of the materials. Now, if you go to zero energy buildings, suddenly you see the construction and the embodied energy to jump significantly. And that's when people have start to thinking how we can achieve zero carbon. The other important factor is that don't forget that globally, the emissions related to the construction is about 11%. So we don't know the UAE figures, but in order to go zero carbon, we have to think how to decarbonize the construction. Now, Philippa was spot on on data. We need data. We need a lot of data because unless we have data, we cannot explain to clients, to stakeholders, how we can, uh, uh, first of all, what is the requirement and how to go from 100 to zero. Uh, I believe there are a lot of data, but unfortunately due to the policies, due to security of data, due to uh, other issues associated how con contractors operate, these data are not available. I mean, I have worked in the Middle East uh, uh, on a construction reduction emissions project in 2015, which was very difficult to get the data. But when we start pushing the contractor to get the data, actually they're doing it already because on every project, before the beginning of the project, they know how much energy they're going to consume, how many people they're going to have aside, what type of generators they're going to have, how big the generators will be. And they already have the special graphs. These contractors have different graphs that can give us all this data. However, this is something like the holy grail for the contractor operations because how that's how they operate. Now, if it was a framework of open communication where information from the contractors could be transmitted to the designers and to the clients, 
that will open completely the picture of to think more on reducing the emissions of carbon construction, sorry, emissions of the construction. Uh, yes, we have to discuss it. Now, <laughs> I understand the large clients in the regions already, they, they're doing it. Uh, the global events is a requirement and they have to achieve more and more reduced targets. But if you see the, uh, the budget of these events against the overall budget of the construction industry is a small pie, a piece of the pie. Somehow the good practice for this mega project has to open and has to communicate it not only to the local authorities and the government, but also to the developers and the small clients just to start understanding how they can go to net zero. Thank you, that was a really concise answer. Um, I need to have my eye on the clock a bit. Um, I would like you to ask you one last question though, but it would be great if you could answer it with yes, no, and why. So I'll give you three sentences each. Um, so we, we have obviously a lot, a few um, green building codes in the region um, and sustainability frameworks uh, in place. Do you see room and the need for an overall strategic plan to decarbonize construction? So um, yeah, if we can go around yes, no, and why, or why not, that would be amazing. And then we move to the question from the audience. Who wants to start? Harry, Harry looks ready. I was gonna say Yanni was ready to, to go for that one. <laughs> <laughs> you answer it, Yanni, is what I'm thinking. <laughs> I will say yes, but it has to be the correct framework. I mean, legal framework, stakeholder engagement framework, for people to feel comfortable to release the data and do something about that. And of course, before that, there must be an explanation to tell them if you do it correctly, at the end of the day, some contractors and clients save money by focusing on the materials and the construction processes. Yeah. Yeah. Philippa, what are your thoughts? Um, I'd say yes, but uh, it would need to be a high level strategic kind of um, framework and it should be performance based and not too restrictive. Um, so, you know, a, a high level strategic performance based framework that allows people to target achieving it in, in a variety of different ways. Awesome. Um, Tag, do you have any, any other thoughts? I think, we go. I, I think everybody's going yes here, but I think we all appreciate what the challenge of, of doing that would be. So we probably, probably have a little bit of, you know, what does that, what does it fundamentally mean? How would it actually work? Uh, are there challenges here? I also, and I just kind of want to briefly look at some of the, the questions here because they're, they're, they're asking about when is the UAE going to decarbonize? When it, you know, as if, as if it is, you know, a bubble and we don't interact with the rest of the world. The whole idea of embodied energy is that you're probably burning carbon somewhere else and bringing it in. So I don't exactly know yeah. what yeah. net zero is in that respect and how that would go into any sort of framework. So cautious, yes, if it were. Okay, okay, take it, that's fine. <laughs> okay, um, let's move on to the question we got. And uh, we got, I think, five. Um, so um, uh, the first question who came in is, who are the key stakeholders contributing to net zero? And I think, Harry, you put your hand up um, that you would like to answer the question. Yeah, there's been some very good questions come in there. Um, there's that one. There's also the, does it need to be top down or bottom up approach? And then obviously, yeah. does net zero uh, realistically, uh, is it achievable in the UAE? So I was just thinking of- Knock them all out. Combine, yeah, exactly. Combining an answer to all those. Um, the bottom line is, without sounding too cheesy, everybody's a stakeholder in contributing to net zero. Um, and I think one of the things that we've seen over the last 18 months, um, who would have thought that Greta Thunberg was a key stakeholder in driving net zero? Nobody. Who would have thought that the, the, the kids, and I do say the kids of, of, of the world, would, have, would be a key contributor? You've got the head of the UN and the likes of David Attenborough recognizing that the hope that they hold for us to be able to avert climate change disaster is not in our generation, although we've got something to do with it, it's, it's the next generation um, and the, the energy and the pressure they're putting on us. So without sounding a little cheesy, um, I would say everybody, um, but in, in, and, but in, in uh, parallel with that, the top down bottom up approach, we need both, uh, we need absolutely both. And I think that's been shown as well over the last 18 months. If you're gonna stand around taking it out of the Middle East for a second, if you look at uh, the rest of the world, if we're waiting for the politicians to, uh, to sort out what they're going to do or they're not going to do, depending on whether they're going to get voted in or not, we're going to be here for another 50 years waiting for something to happen. 
So it's um, it's it's uh, commercial enterprise uh, entrepreneurs um, that have that bottom up drive, and I think now we're we're beginning to see the cascading drive from from top down as well. But I think touching also on 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 data, um, which was mentioned earlier, we need to be very careful. We don't fall into the trap of assuming that the dynamics in the Middle East are the same as. Uh, in the US, uh, the very, very the big difference is that the economic drivers for sustainability in the Middle East are um, limited, if not absent. Sorry, the economic drivers historically for sustainability in Europe and the, and, uh, the US, etc., have been very different to the Middle East. Um, yeah. Fuel costs, electricity costs, and water costs were massive drivers for, for sustainability in, in, uh, in Europe, etc. Those are much less important in the Middle East. Um, because of you know there's very efficient subsidies which are possible because of obviously the oil and gas industry so um so yeah i do and to to, to wrap out about whether it's possible in the uae um i think we can say the same for other gulf nations that the the uh the luxury that these nations have is that they do have the financial capital to be able to make the investment to be able to drive these changes much more quickly than in other countries that don't have the, the same um uh, oil and gas reserves in the background, or, you know, financial reserves in the background. So hopefully I hit a couple of points there, Lisa. Yeah, I think I think you ticked them. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, Philippa, um, IDP, um, the integrated development process is part of most green building systems, uh, but green building ratings, sorry. Do you think that those requirements are enough or there's more need for uh, net zero targets? That's one question came in as well. Um, in terms of the IDB process, I mean, it's, um, uh, again, it kind of depends on what you look at in terms of the definition of IDP. It's, it's included in various rating systems in different formats, mm. but the, um, the essential um, objective is, of IDP is that sustainability is fully integrated um, yeah. across the, the design process. Um, so uh, are those requirements enough? It, it depends which requirements specifically you're looking at. Um, but I would probably link back to something that Harry was saying earlier in that historically we've focused a lot on integrating sustainability within the design team, but really we should be focusing on integrating across the whole project team. So looking at people like the procurement um, team and, and more people on the client side, the cost consultants, it's really important to engage the full stakeholder um, uh, group in sustainability and integrating it across all um, disciplines and, and all kind of different um, viewpoints to make sure that the, the goals are aligned across the whole project life cycle. So yeah, IDP is very important. Um, it's a, you can't achieve, I, I don't believe you can achieve a, a net zero building without a fully integrated design process, um, but perhaps we need to think a little bit bigger um, on, on what IDP means and how we apply that to, to projects. Thank you. That's my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, last question uh, is what about existing building stock? Are there strategies in place towards a net zero retrofit? Tag, Yanis, who wants to take it? I think I'll start this one um, okay. because, well, I'm currently supervising one of the research projects on exactly this. Um, mm -hmm. And there aren't, I don't think there's a strategy involved in it. I mean, you will hear about um, different incentive schemes around the world um, to, to, I suppose, reduce the um, operational energy. But, but I, no, I wouldn't say that's a, I don't think that's an approach that, that's going to do it. Um, but I think with all of these things, we have to start thinking about the motivation um, of people and what motivates people to change. And... Uh, most people are motivated by money, and this is uh, this is what's happening in retrofit now. And it's a very simple calculation to say: if I insulate my house, my energy bill will go down by this much, my return will will be this, and and and, and that and that works. But if if that's if money doesn't exactly account for energy or or um, or embodied energy as much as anything else, then then no, I don't think there is a strategy um, for it. Uh, I, I think everybody's kind of, we've, we've all touched on it, but we haven't faced it down yet, um, that these things don't necessarily have to be a huge hardship. And we don't have to be doing it for necessarily virtue. We need to create an environment that isn't just about the, the virtuousness of, of sustainability. Uh, that it is a virtue, but I, I just don't think it's the prime motivator. Uh, until everybody does it, uh, it's, it, it's certainly not. So you have to create an environment where it is taboo to not, or 
um, you, you make it somehow um, profitable, I guess is the best. You, you, we've met, you've heard the words there, the investment, investing. It, it's, not a, it's not a cash, uh, you know, throwing it into the wind. It, it, it should be an investment. And, and I think um, this is a part of the world where um, it, 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 as it has the reserves, but it, it also has the potential to make a business of it and lead. And, and that's really the challenge and the excitement of, of this part of the world, I think. So I've, I've deviated a little bit from the question, but I was kind of keen, keen to get that bit in. <laughs> Uh, that. Thanks. Janis, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, yes, I would like to add on two questions. Uh, first of all, when do we believe the net zero will be achieved in the UA? That's, that's a very good question. Uh, because I think that it can be within the Paris Agreement, but this will be a collaborative approach from all the industry bodies and everybody involved. We talk, I can see a lot of pivot points. It will not be a top-down or a bottom-up. Both part, I mean, the industry, the designers, the government has to discuss how this is going to be achieved, especially in the infrastructure sector. You cannot push the contractors. The contractors cannot push the government for things to happen. But all of them has to work collaboratively. The other thing about the IDP is my main, my, the response about the IDP. Uh, the question is, what, what is IDP nowadays? Because... I have been in some project is a meeting and people, some people crossing out some tick boxes and discussing. But in reality, IDP is the whole project started at the beginning with a collaborative model. And nowadays, uh, the beauty of multidisciplinary organizations is you, you can load everything to the cloud and you can run these models automatically. So if you would like to progress from, for example, from the concept to the schematic design, with one week you can model everything from carbon abutment, from construction programs, for emissions, uh, projected emissions of the project. So the question is not what it means, how it's used in the construction. Uh, and things can be done. The question is, are the clients ready to impose the right questions to the designers? Uh, because most of the projects that have been driven forward have been driven by clients that they're open-minded or they have to achieve some global agreement targets. And th that's how we have to think. I mean, can we define these targets? Can the client understand the targets? Can the government contribute or support the clients on the standard targets? And then everything will start rolling and, and, and there is a momentum. I have to say there is a lot of momentum but somehow all of the parties have to sit together and find a common approach. Thank you so much for that contribution. Um, thank you guys all for that discussion. I think we touched on so many points in such little time. It was pretty impressive. Um, I think something which stands out for me is that obviously we talked a lot around the region and um, we talked about the construction industry in particular. But something we can't forget is that carbon management, climate change is something which does, is not shouldn't be looked at in a silo. So um, we're not just uh, on, a, on a country border, we just stop, um, it just stops. So I think it's just about that importance um, on a global level it just needs to be, uh, we just need to raise that awareness a lot more. Um, are there any final thoughts you would like to share before I head over to Dr. Nendu? I think just very, very quickly, Lisa, unless we change um, the commercial metrics on how a re return on investment is calculated, we're not going to see this rate change that we need. We've already seen over the last few years uh, people saying that, you know, if things don't change, we're going to face the end of civilization as we know it. I mean, if that doesn't wake up anybody, nobody, yeah. nothing will. So what's very clear is the scientific fact of what's actually happening ecologically and climatically in the world is just not getting the traction it needs. Unfortunately, we're completely blinded by profit and loss. So that's reality. So unless we change our language to driving um, to uh, a business case for, for green buildings and, and decarbonization, we're not going to see the changes. And the only way to do that is by changing how we assess um, the, the uh, profit and loss accountability from short term to much, much longer term. So add one tiny thing to that then as well. Um, and that is that we're always frustrated by the pace of change. But if, if anything else, we've learned this year is how quick change can can be affected. So mm -hmm. to a certain extent, you know, it's very much within our grasp. I mean, it, if I was saying this last year, I'd be saying, oh, my goodness, it's going to take for absolute ever. But, but change can happen in a step, <laughs> you know. It, and so 
it, it's not impossible. So it should be an ambitious, uh, uh, you know, uh, target for us that, that that we also think that we can achieve. Um, Philippa, Yanni, I know we're like a little bit late, so if you guys want to um, just add some final thoughts. I think the uh, guys have summed it up well. <laughs> okay. uh, w one final thought. Uh, I mean, here we got uh, as an institutional approach to the smart cities, and smart cities is about communication of data. Information, uh, IoT nowadays can provide a lot of benefits, especially what's happening with the carbon emissions in construction. My understanding is some of the large contractors here, they have already experimented. And they start collecting data for different reasons. So it will be a good thing to think also carbon accounting as part of the smart operations of a city. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Nandu, over to you. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, thank you to all our speakers for such an interesting discussion. And uh, thank you to the um, audience for your participation. Uh, finally, um, I just want to draw your attention to our next webinar scheduled for the 19th of January, 2021, 7 p.m. GST. Uh, it's titled Closing the Graduate Skill Gap in the Middle East, Construction Market, What Can Universities Do? Um, we'll be communicating with you further details about the um, webinar coming up in January. So that's all for this evening's uh, webinar. Have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. You may now disconnect. Have a safe um, day. Good night. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Harry. See you later. Bye. Cheers, man.